Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Do you like sake? I do, well, some, somewhat. It's not my go-to in general, but I do enjoy well-made sake. Today's show will be the first of three shows on sake. We'll take a moderately deep dive into the beverage, so get comfortable, grab your favorite sake, and let's have some fun. So what is sake? Some call it a rice wine. Others say it's brewed like beer. Well, it's neither and both at the same time. Sake is a fermented beverage made with rice. Both beer and wine are also fermented. And rice is used to make some beers. Bud Light proudly lists rice as one of its ingredients but it's really where the comparisons end. Wine is made from fruit, specifically grapes, unless you're making a fruit wine like strawberry wine. And while beer is made from grains, including rice, beer goes through a different process to achieve its final result. Like I said, it's a bit of both, but it's really its own category. As far as the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau, also known as the TTB for short, uh, as, long as, as far as they're concerned, it's classified as a beer for production or tax purposes and classified as a wine for labeling purposes. Much of the information I'm giving you comes from various sources. The Wikipedia entry on sake, the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association, a complete guide to Japanese sake, uh, Guild Psalms expert guide on sake, an article on Junmai Sake from Serious Eats, and an article from the website The Japanese Bar on a specific rice variety to supplement this info. I'll have links below to everything. I can say that I found the complete guide to Japanese sake late in my research, and it connected a lot of the dots, plus made some great additional content. Let me address Japanese pronunciation here for a minute. For the most part, the sounds for Japanese are fairly familiar to English speakers. We share a lot of the same sounds. As with any language, there are some that are not familiar and can be difficult. Many words have a Western version of the pronunciation that we understand, but is technically incorrect in Japan. I will do my best to stay uh, true to proper Japanese pronunciation as possible, but I may slip into what I'm used to saying or using the more Western way of pronunciation. In addition, I'll put the Japanese word using the most common Western spelling in a lower third when I first use a word to help reinforce each term. I may do this more than once depending on the word and if I feel if it needs it. I'll also include the English meaning. I've included a link to a YouTube video that helps explain how to pronounce Japanese words if you're interested in upping your game. I found it very helpful myself. And then one more thing about Japanese pronunciation, which I found really interesting, is that there are no accents in Japanese. We don't accentuate a syllable, we, they don't accentuate syllables like we do in English and other languages. So it's really just all, not monotone, but it's all just the same emphasis. So uh, something like sake is, we, we, sometimes we, we emphasize the K as sake, or, you know, or, or go sake, it's sake. And every syllable is the same amount of time and the same emphasis. However, you may start at a lower pitch and finish at a higher pitch or start at a higher and a lower pitch. So there is a bit of sing song to it. I'm not gonna try to replicate that because I don't know the proper pitch for these words and the pitch can also change the meaning. Fun, right? All right, so sake has definitely been around for a long time. Beer and wine have probably been around much longer, but rice has been the source of alcoholic beverages in Japan for almost 2,500 years. In the third century, Chinese history books mention Japanese sake and the use of it during funerals. In the early eighth century, what we know as sake is mentioned. Initially, it was a governmental product for religious ceremonies, court festivals, and drinking games. What? Sake bombs! Anyway, no. Eventually, in the 12th century, temples and shrines 
took over becoming the main way sake was produced for 500 years. It's also in the 10th century where we have records of sake production. In the late 1800s, it became legal for basically anyone with enough money to make sake. Tens of thousands of breweries opened up in one year. This eventually dwindled down to around 8,000 because of, well, government and their love of taxation. The Japanese government opened the Sake Brewing Research Institute in 1904. They also started government-ran sake tasting competition in 1907. In addition to this, other advances in sake production occurred, such as the selection of specific yeast strains for sake and the use of enamel-coated steel tanks rather than wood barrels. Now, throughout the 20th century, sake saw its ups and downs. Rice shortages during World War II reduced production. Producers started cutting their sake to increase yields, with, and some even made sake without rice. You know what else is made without rice? You guessed it, my line of merchandise from One World TV, and what I call my outstanding line of merchandise. Then you'd be right. My outstanding line is all about positivity and is based on my response of outstanding when I'm being asked how I'm doing. The Outstanding line is all t-shirts for now. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories for the WWTV line. Check out this sweet logo t-shirt. Both lines are getting more variations in the future, so look for them on Zazzle. Link below in the description, so please check them out. Okay, let's talk more sake. So how's it made? Only certain rice is used for premium sake. At least 80 different types of sake rice, known as sakamai, are used. Of these 80 different varieties, the most popular are, and I'm going to do my best with the pronunciation on this. Really, there's only one I know how to do. The others are, there's two of them that are a little bit difficult for me, but Yamada Nishiki, which is the one I know the best. Okay, for the rest, Goya Kumangoku, Mayama Nishiki, and Omachi. Uh, those other three, in addition to the Yamada Nishiki, are uh, the most popular rices that are used. The grain is longer, stronger, if a grain is small or weak, it'll break in the polishing process and contains less protein or lipid than ordinary table rice. Yamada Nishiki is the most commonly grown sake rice. In 1923, Yamada Nishiki was created by crossing Yamadaho and Tankanwa Tarabune. Ooh, I think I got it right. And this was done in 1936, or in 1936, the rice was then named Yamada Nishiki. This special rice is mainly grown in the Hyogo Prefecture, its original area, but it's also grown uh, in Okayama and Fukuoka, among other areas. What makes this variety the most desirable is that it has a high amount of what is known as shimpaku. This is the starchy heart of the rice grain that is the key to the production of sake. Up to 75% of the grain is made up this made up of this shimpaku. It's I think it's kind of, they, they're, they're, in Japanese, those um, vowels are really short vowels too. Well, every syllable is short, but it seems like the vowels at the end are really short. I'm gonna quote from the Guild Psalm expert guy concerning three other varieties, well, three varieties, two of which I've already mentioned, the third one. I didn't mention earlier, so get another popular variety. Goya Kumangoku produces leaner, cleaner styles of sake, most famously in the Niigata, but also in the Toyama and Fukushima prefectures. Mayama Nishiki fares well in colder temperatures and yields richer, more textural sake. It thrives in Akita and Yamagata. Omachi, the oldest rice variety that's used today, has been employed in sake production since 1859. It can be found in Okayama and Hiroshima. Table rice can be used, but it's for what they call ordinary sake. Premium versus non-premium sake is 25% premium and 75% uh, non-premium for sake production. In order to prepare the rice for fermentation, you have to polish or mill away the outer part of the rice grain. The outer layers contain fats, vitamins, and proteins. These are not desirable for sake. You need the starch in the center of the grain, and to do that, you must strip away the other stuff. Polishing is measured in percentages that indicate how much of the rice grain remains. This is known as seima ibuai. What you are trying to get to is the aforementioned shimpaku, or the pocket of starch in the center of the grain. The more you polish the rice that is required to make sake, the more sake costs. Back in 2017 at TechSum, I got to see what this looks like for rice. Here is a picture of Yamada Nishiki rice in four different states. You have unmilled and then three different levels of daiginja, which I'll get to in a, in a second. 
50%, 39%, and 23% sei mai buai, or milling. I also got to meet the man himself, Takeyoshi Honda. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple years ago. His brewery, Honda Shoten, makes Tatsuriki sake and is basically the equivalent of uh, Domaine de la Romanticanti in Burgundy, and I got to taste some of it back then in 2017. Funny enough, I went to Burgundy in 2017. I've li but I didn't go to DRC. <laughs> I've linked to a website that has a video about uh, Chairman Honda, as he's known, uh, in the description. It's in Japanese, but there are English subtitles. It details how he became the foremost expert in Yamana Nishiki. They also show the rinsing process that I'll get to in a minute. The video is a total of 27 minutes long and is from 2017. Like beer and also spirits, water is a very important part of the production of sake. It is used to wash the rice and also to dilute the sake before it's bottled. Elements in the water affect flavors, aromas, and the color of sake. It also provides nutrients to the yeast. It's so important that the best water is in the Naragogo region of Hyogo Prefecture. The specific source is called Mayumizu and is so prized that many producers set up shop near it. The Mayumizu water is or has low, high levels of phosphates and potassium which aid fermentation. The Hyogo Prefecture has the most sake producers of any prefecture. During this washing process, the workers carefully monitor how much water is absorbed. Too much makes the rice weak. The goal is to make the rice about 30% heavier. They soak the rice in water for about 30 seconds at a time and then compare the weight before soaking and after soaking. This is repeated as necessary. It's not an exact science. Water temperature and rinse temperature affect the absorption. This also allows the steaming process to break up the starch and also sterilizes the rice. This process hardens the outside while softening the inside and also allows a specific fungus to work its magic. Now for this next part, I'm going to be quoting a lot directly from both the Comprehensive Sake Guide and the Wikipedia entry. Grape juice contains sugars which ferment in the presence of yeast, but with beverages made from grains such as sake and beer, it is first necessary to use enzymes to break down the starch in the grain to convert it to sugar before yeast fermentation. In order to do this, a special kind of fungus called kojikin, officially known as aspergillus orizai, is an essential part of the fermentation process. During sake brewing, spores of kojikin are scattered over steamed rice to produce koji. This is the rice in which kojikin spores are cultivated. Under warm and moist conditions, the kojikin spores germinate and release enzymes called amylases that convert the rice starches into glucose. The process of starch conversion into simpler sugars, for example, glucose and maltose, is called saccharification. Yeast turns this glucose into alcohol via fermentation. This saccharification is also known as malting in the beer world. The big difference here is that while fermentation occurs after saccharification in beer brewing, saccharification via kojikin and fermentation via yeast occurs simultaneously in sake brewing. This is known as multiple parallel fermentation, or MPF for short, and is mostly unique to sake. So multiple parallel fermentation is the conversion of starch into glucose followed immediately by conversion into alcohol. This process distinguishes sake from other fermented beverages like beer because it occurs in a single vat. Whereas with beer, for instance, starch to glucose conversion and glucose to alcohol conversion occur in separate vats or vessels. The breakdown of starch into glucose is caused by the kojikin fungus, while the conversion of glucose into alcohol is caused by the yeast. Due to the yeast being available as soon as the glucose is produced, the conversion of glucose to alcohol is very efficient in sake brewing. This results in sake having a generally higher alcohol content than beer and wine initially. With wine, everything happens in one vat, but there is no need for sacrification since the sugar is readily available in the pressed juice. That brings us to the fermentation process. The brewer first needs to prepare the seed mash, known as either shubo or moto. Shubo means mother of sake, while the word moto means base or source. High quality yeast is used as a starter for fermentation, and they use a lot of it at this stage to get things going. The shubo needs to be highly acidic in order to prevent spoilage. The problem is that rice has no acid unlike grapes. You can either use lactic acid bacilli, or also known as LAB, or brewing grade lactic acid to achieve this. 
The total amount of rice placed in a single fermentation tank ranges from less than one metric ton to more than 10 metric tons. It is not all added at once, but in three steps over four days. On the first day, the amount of steamed rice and koji placed in the tank is equal to one sixth of the total. Seed mash, or the shubo, is also added on the first day. Nothing is added on the second day. Now, this is to give the yeast time to multiply. On the third day, an amount equal to two-sixths of the total is placed in the tank, with the remaining three-sixths, or the remaining half, added on the fourth day. If the entire amount were added to the tank at once, the yeast would become too diluted, prolonging the time required to reach the right density for the proper fermentation of alcohol and allowing microbes to multiply, which could abort the fermentation process and spoil the mixture. That is why the process is carried out in this manner. This becomes a main mash, known as moromi. At this point, the enzymes in koji dissolve the steamed rice and the yeast ferments the resulting sugars simultaneously in a single tank. The fermentation process takes around three to four weeks, yielding an alcoholic content of around 17 to 20%. 17, it may have sounded like it said 70. After the fermentation process is complete, the fermented moromi is pressed to remove the sake lees and then pasteurized and filtered for color. The sake is then stored in bottles under cold conditions. The entire process of making sake can range from 60 to 90 days, while the fermentation alone can take two weeks. For maturation, like other brewed beverages, sake tends to benefit from a period of storage. Nine to 12 months are required for a sake to mature. Maturation is caused by physical and chemical factors such as oxygen supply, the broad application of external heat, nitrogen oxides, aldehydes, and amino acids, among other unknown factors. So what is a person called who makes sake? A toji. Toji is the job title of the sake brewer named after Du Kong. Uh, it is a highly respected job in the Japanese society with toji being regarded like musicians or painters, the title of toji was historically passed from father to son. Today, new toji are either veteran brewery workers or are trained at universities. While modern breweries will, with cooling tanks operate year-round, most old-fashioned sake breweries are seasonal, operating only in the cool winter months. During the summer and fall, most toji work elsewhere, commonly on farms, only periodically returning to the brewery to supervise storage conditions or bottling operations. So did you get all that? Basically, there are two simultaneous fermentations going on. Conversion of starch into glucose and then that same glucose being converted into alcohol. These two processes in beer happen at separate stages in different areas. Okay, ready for some more confusion? It really doesn't need to be confusing, but it is to many people, including me some of the time. There are two different types of sake. We have futsushu and tokutei meishoshi. The first is ordinary sake, the futsushu, basically the same as table wine. Tokutei meishoshi is known as special designation sake or premium sake. This is where the polishing ratios come into play. The special designation sake is further broken down into four grades, Junmai, Hanjozu, Ginjo, and Daiginjo. Let's put up a graphic to help explain these. I took this from Guild Psalm's expert guide on sake. There are other sake quality pyramids out there, but I think this one combines everything the best. This kind of reminds me of sherry and how things can branch out, though sherry is a bit more complicated and it's different, but in my head, that's how I think of it. First, you have two sides. On the left, brewer spirit is added to the sake, and on the right, no spirit is added. Concerning the addition of brewer spirit for special designation sake, Japanese law states this. In sake containing jozo alcohol as an ingredient, the weight of said alcohol converted to 95% alcohol must not exceed 10% of the weight of polished rice. Jozo alcohol is defined as this. Jozo alcohol refers to ethyl alcohol distilled from fermented starch or sugar-containing substances. Starting at the bottom, we have ordinary table sake, futsushu. No milling requirement for this level. With that said, the rice used to make futsushu is polished to around 70% on average, and the amount of jozo alcohol used is equivalent to about 20% of the weight of the polished rice. Then we get to the special designation sakes. On the left, we start with honjozo. The rice is milled to at least 70% remaining, 
or a se'i ma'i bu'ai of 70%. This means it could be less than that. In other words, there could be 65% of the rice grain left. Here's the Japanese regulation concerning honjozo. Sake that has a good flavor, color, and luster and is made with polished rice with a se'i ma'i bu'ai of no more than 70%. Koji, rice, jozo alcohol, and water. On the right is junmai. Essentially the same as hanjozo, but no added spirit. Now you'll notice the graphic says 80%. A few years ago, things changed and it seems like there is some confusion on this point. This is directly from the Japanese regulation concerning junmai. Sake that has a good flavor, color, and luster and is made with polished rice, koji rice, and water. It used to be 70% and a lot of producers will still stay with that tradition. It's no longer required or no longer regulated. Next we have Tokubetsu Hanjozo on the left and Tokubetsu Junmai on the right. There needs to be a unique characteristic or the rice is milled to 60% remaining. This unique characteristic must be something that distinguishes it from the producer's normal method. This characteristic must be stated on the label. If so, then the milling could be 70% instead. The term tokubetsu can only be used in conjunction with honjozo or junmai. In other words, you can't have a tokubetsu ginjo or dai ginjo or anything like that. In addition, the regulations state this. For junmai shu or honjozo shu, that has an especially good flavor, color, and luster, the classifications tokubetsu junmai shu or tokubetsu hanjozo shu may be used in cases where objective criteria such as the ingredients used or the manufacturing process are explained on the container or packaging of said sake. If the se'i ma'ibuai is the basis of such explanation, the sake must have a se'i ma'ibuai of 60% or less. Next level up is Ginjo on the left and Jumai Ginjo on the right. We are now at a Sei Mai Buai of 60% or less. This is considered a sweet spot between Kaori, which is an aromatic, fruity, and floral style of sake, and Aji, which is a textured, savory, taste driven style. Here is the Japanese regulation concerning the term Ginjo sake that has an inherently good flavor, color, and luster, and is carefully made with polished rice having a se'e ma'ibuai of no more than 60%, koji rice and water, or with these ingredients together with jozo alcohol. At the top of the pyramid, we have daiginjo and jumai daiginjo styles. These are actually a subcategory of their respective ginjo styles. We are now at a se'e ma'ibuai of 50%. As much as 91% of the rice may be milled away. In other words, a se'e ma'ibuai of 9% which is usually described as the Kaiori style. Regarding the term Daiginjo, let's go back to the Japanese regulations for this. For Ginjo Shu with an especially good inherent flavor, color, and luster that is made with polished rice and having a Sei Maibuai of 50% or less, the classification Daiginjo Shu may be used. As I mentioned earlier, all the styles on the right have the prefix Junmai, so this indicates no spirit is added what does the spirit really do though? It adds texture and actually lightens the sake. It was originally used to stretch sake during World War II. It makes a more mineral driven and cleaner product. You'll also notice that as the rice is milled away, you go from that aji style of earthy, rustic, and savory towards the kaori style of fruity and floral. Is your mind spinning yet? All right, let's try to summarize what we've learned so far. Sake in its current form has been around since at least 700 AD. It is made from rice with premium sake made up to 80 different varieties, the most popular being Yamana Nishiki. It uses what is known as MPF for multiple parallel fermentation, meaning the conversion of starch to sugar and then sugar to alcohol happens at the same time in the same vessel. The heart of the rice is where this starch lives and the more you mill the rice, the higher the quality of starch you get. This translates into higher quality sake. As you go up in quality, the sake changes from being earthy, rustic, and savory to more fruity and floral. The addition of brewer spirit means the prefix junmai is dropped and it adds a minerality to the sake while making it lighter. So have you seen in the movies or on TV people drinking hot sake? Is that really a thing? Yeah. But most premium sake is drank chilled or at room temperature. These sakes, or this one you see here, uh, all say served chilled on the label. 
Uh, this isn't so chilled anymore. It's a little bit warmed up now, but it's not quite room temperature. So what about heated sake? Usually that's your ordinary sake or maybe just a Honjozo or Junmai, but I'd say that's not very common. A big reason why ordinary sake is served hot is because of tradition and it often hides flaws, making it taste better. There are a range of common serving temperatures that are mostly in increments of five degrees Celsius for serving sake. For the most common terms, I'll refer to the guild psalm as Wikipedia only mentions the increments but not the terms. All right, starting with hottest to coolest. 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit is tobikirikan, fly away for good. 50 degrees Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit is Asukan or hot hot. 45 degrees Celsius or 113 degrees Fahrenheit is Jokan or upper hot. 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit is Nurukan or warm hot. 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit is Hitohadakan, a person's skin hot. 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit is Hinatakan, out in the sun hot. Ever been to Texas? <laughs> it's way hotter than that. Anyway, a 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit is joan or normal room temperature. Notice that the con suffix ends as it seems to mean hot. Next, we get to 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Suzu bie or cool chilled. Then it's 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Hana bie or flower chilled. Then we get to five degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That is Yuki A B A, uh, which is snow chilled. I'll assume the suspects B A means chilled. And this seems like a good time to stop for today. While I covered what is probably the most important parts of sake production, I have some more to cover. Uh, so next week I'll cover more in the history, some extra terms, sake service and other stuff. And then the third week, I'll cover even more information about sake. Plus, I've got some sake to taste, so let's get into this first one now. All right, I chose this one because it's quote a real sake. You remember the legal term from sake from about half hour ago? It's called seishu. Next week's sake is also a quote real sake, and the one in two weeks isn't technically a sake, it's a nigori, but I'll get to that when we get to it. All right, I'll have to say I've had all three of the sakes I'm gonna have over these next few weeks, a few months ago. I remember liking all three. I'll also say that nigori is usually what I like the best and seishu tends to come across as bitter to me. And I can't remember if it's in my script or not, but bitter is actually a bad thing for sake. So it's how I perceive it. It's not actually true bitterness. I think that's in the next week or the week after we talk about bitterness and sake. That doesn't mean I haven't had some really nice real sake like this. In the interest of time, I won't go through any of the detailed history of these sakes. I've linked to their websites uh, each week so you can read up on them. So let's just get to tasting. But first, the stats of this sake. By the way, it has no brewer spirit. It is the Miyashita Sake Brewery Mighty Peak. It's available for about $16. It is a Tokubetsu Jumai Sake so it is a sake that is either milled to at least 70% or, and or has a special characteristic. Ibaraki Prefecture is where it's from. Uh, I have a link to the prefecture's website below. You should check it out. It's pretty cool. Seimai Buai, or the milling rate, is 58%. So it qualifies, as I understand it, as tokubetsu on this alone. The rice type, Yamada Nishiki. So we've got the good stuff here. Nihonshu Do, uh, or the sake meter, is a plus one. The text sheet I found doesn't give the precise number, but it looks like a one. So it's not quite neutral. More on this scale next week. The ABV is 15%. And the serving temperature is very chilled to lukewarm. And I would probably put it in the lukewarm or slightly less than lukewarm uh, category. So time to taste. Now you might be going, but Mark, why aren't you using those fancy cups? You got, I'll get to that in next week. I think it's next week's episode. I'll get to those. All right. So, um, 
all sake is either going to be like clear, like water white clear, or it's going to be um, um, cloudy or nigori. Okay. So there isn't necessarily any color to talk about. The color that's being picked up um, in the glass is more from the bottle than anything else. I mean, it is like we water white. So let's just get into aromas and flavors. So on the nose, it's definitely, I would, say, I would probably call it a medium plus aromatics. You get, you definitely get some more fruit characteristics and you do get a little bit of floral to it. And there's, I mean, it smells like rice. I mean, there's like a sweet rice, like a, like, like a, I don't know, like a sweet rice ball thing. You kind of get that, uh, 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 that, that aroma to it. And there's also like this, um, there was this special candy. I remember when I used to work at this, uh, Chinese restaurant here in San Antonio in, in high school, it used to be a dishwasher. And they also had this, we just called it Chinese candy. I don't remember what the candy actually was, but it was a rice candy. Uh, I do remember that part. It came, it was like wrapped in rice paper. It has that kind of aroma to it. On the floral, it's kind of a, just a generic white flower. Maybe, I don't know, just because I'm thinking about Asia and China blossoms, you know, maybe that. I mean, not China blossoms, cherry blossoms. Maybe power suggestion, I smell cherry also, but... Yeah, there's just kind of like this like fruitiness, like a juicy fruit fruitiness type of thing. Let's check it out. So yeah, that, that fruity and floral aspect definitely comes through. You can taste the alcohol. You can taste it as 15%. Now, I don't know in, in sake if alcohol percentages can range like they can in wine. As far as you know, in beer, it cannot. In, in spirits, it cannot. It's whatever the alcohol is, what's what the alcohol is. You can't, you don't have like this range. Whereas wine, you can have, depending on the, the alcohol listed on the label, you can have a, a pretty wide range. I'm not saying this feels like more than 15%, but you can definitely feel the alcohol on it. But it's not like boozy, right? There's kind of a hibiscus component to this and that kind of sweeter rice component. There's also that kind of really juicy fruit gum uh, flavor, which I really don't know what that flavor is. I, I know it's a group of flavors, but maybe touch a banana in this. Yeah, maybe a little, maybe a little uh, banana in this, which I think is a normal, I think it's actually a typical um, flavor aroma. We're gonna get to those in another couple of weeks. We're gonna have the whole flavor aroma wheel. We're gonna go through all this. So, I mean, we got a lot, to, we got a lot of ground to cover in the next two weeks. It's a very pleasant taste in sake. And one thing about sake is because it doesn't have the same things like that, that um, wine has, and there's no oak aging and all that kind of stuff. You don't have like this broadness, there's no malolactic fermentation going on. So you don't get this creaminess or reduction in acid. Uh, you don't get, uh, you don't get those flavors. You don't get, there's no diacetyl. So you don't get anything buttery. It, it tastes like a very light wine in many aspects. That's probably why a lot of people consider it like a rice wine. But then we also know it's brewed and we call them breweries. So well, you, you make beer at breweries. It's a very pleasant sake. Like this is something you could like kind of chill and like sit outside and it's a little warm outside, maybe like a little warm spring day, maybe even, you know, kind of a hotter summer day. I would, I would equate this to something like a Vermentino or Pinot Grigio or a really light Sauvignon Blanc, uh, something that's really refreshing, something that you can really just kind of relax and, and, and sip on. And you could do it just on its own. You don't have to have any, any food with it. If you are gonna do food, then you could have um, salads, lighter fare, like salads and fruit, and you could also have uh, definitely seafood uh, with this. Uh, again, if you've been watching my stuff for a long time, you know I don't eat seafood, but I have a basic understanding of each types of seafood and what they taste like because I've had a lot of them to prove that I don't like it. Um, so, uh, and sake, of course, is the the kind of default type of drink that you have with uh, lots of seafood, especially sushi and other Japanese or other Asian uh, fare. But um, you definitely can do sushi with this. Uh, you could do things like oysters, clams, scallops, that kind of stuff. Um, 
it would definitely pair well with that. There's, um, and especially because we're going to get to this in another couple of weeks, but the, the, uh, the term umami, uh, is, is part of sake and I'll explain to you what that is and how you get that and why, what, what's going on with that, you know, in, next week or the week after, but that plays well with those types of foods. It, it tastes good. There's also a bit of pomaceous to this. It's like a green apple, a pear quality to it. So those fruits are really starting to come through a little bit more for me. It's it's like, it's a flavor profile I'm not entirely used to. So a lot of times you tend to focus on singularity things, singular things. You're like, well, it tastes like, like when people taste wine first, they go, it tastes like wine. You go, what does it taste like? Well, it tastes like wine. They don't, they, they don't have enough experience to, for their palate to figure out that it's raspberry and cranberry and blueberry versus just, it tastes like wine, right? Same thing with sake. I don't drink a lot of sake, but um, that pomaceous was coming through. So the apple, green apple and green pear was starting to come through now. Uh, you had those florals. I was talking about the, the cherry blossoms or hibiscus. Those were a little more prominent to me. The florality was a little more noticeable. Uh, the sweet rice, that rice candy I used to eat in high school. Um, all those are in there. These are good. And for me, they're all pleasant, uh, memories. So it's, it's a very nice sake, easy to drink. All right. Yeah. I got more shows to record. So that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends. And until next time, drink some cool sake like this.